Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar with Campaign Insight in partnership with Hive Marketing Cloud. My name is Edward Craig. I'm head of Content Labs here at Campaign and your host today. In this webinar, we're going to look at how to untangle, untangle your data and improve your marketing agility. That's looking into the challenge of bringing together your audience's data into a usable, singular view that's com compliant and optimized. And yes, we're doing it through the lens of pet food if pet food could be used in optical science, which I very much doubt. For um, this, I'm joined by two great speakers. Um, I've got Rob from um, Hive. Rob, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Rob Horton, CEO of Hive Marketing Cloud. Um, it's a fascinating topic, Ed. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Julia. And that's our cue for Julia, who we're also going, going to hear from. And Julia's from Nature's Menu. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Guy from Nature's Menu. I'm the Digital Channels Director at Nature's Menu, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you this morning our journey. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing both of you your expertise with us today. Our speakers will be setting the scene, then they'll be, dis they'll be discussing in detail how a clever data strategy has led to a digital transformation, as well as giving a degree of agility in these uncertain times that we're enduring. But this isn't a one-way broadcast. We want your input. So please ask questions. We'll answer as many as we can while we're going along and also in a short Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. And there will also be some polls, most probably, probably about pets. So keep an eye out for those. And do remember that this webinar is available on demand 24 hours after it finishes. So you can catch up if you've been disturbed by children or barking dogs and feel free to share it with colleagues and friends. Now, without further delay, it's over to Rob to set the scene. Rob. Hi. Um, so a, a bit about me and, and Hive uh, very briefly. But um, so I've, I've always worked in or around marketing um, for far too many years now. Um, but I, I genuinely I just really still love it. And. You know, I started in um, campaign planning and execution back in the in the day where you you write you write some code, you push a button, and two days later you you hope you got it all right, and the, the results come back um, through analytics, forecasting, um, predictive modeling, the kind of things that we might refer to as data science today, um, and then through uh, technology implementation, consulting in a in a more agency environment. Um, perhaps more enterprise, but across multiple clients and multiple multiple sectors, that's a, a, a great training ground. So I, I, I love my technology and my science, but um, for me, it's that added complexity of the the human interaction that you get from the from the customer. You know, often the the unpredictability, not always in a, in a good way, um, but that's what really keeps it interesting for for me and and the, the team at Hive. And um, when we when we started the the vision for the company was um very much around helping marketeers rather than building generic software so we you know we we use lots of great um, general IT products but that's that's not where our, our area of interest is um I will talk a little bit about the the, the product set later just for for those that are interested um but personally and um, collectively the, the team at Hive spent a lot of our time talking to, to marketeers, um, listening to their challenges, trying to try to uh, help them solve it. And I think the, you know, the topic of this webinar really, um, you know, so the, the core of that really speaks well to that. All right, see if I can operate the slides. Here we go. Um, so with that focus on the customer, um, when I'm when I'm talking to a client about their marketing and the the kind of you know the, the, the challenges that they're they're having the kind of activities they're doing, um, the the kind of things that I'm I'm thinking about that'll be good as examples. So you know I'm looking at an activity they did and I'm interested in what, why did the customer engage particularly well with that offer, um, or um, you know occasionally why did the campaign tank? It you know that does happen sometimes. Um, how how are they engaging? So across what channels they're engaging? What's the best sequences of messages? So if they you know they look at intervals between messages, the the frequency of repeating messages, etc. And also at the the customers themselves are there specific types of customers that are more or less responsive under under different conditions. And for me, there's 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 always another layer to to get down to another layer layer to peel off. And you you have to be really obsessive about getting to that detail in in order to beat the competition. You know, there's someone else out there. Doing the same thing in your sector so you've got to be better than they are so this um this uh, forester article I, I don't know whether we've actually got a link to the um the full article but it's a, it's, it's good I, I recommend people read it um but this quote in particular really really resonates with me 
and um, got me thinking about some of the challenges that we've seen in particular over the last year, but also some of those where they're likely to continue to, to get in the way of those, those marketeers, um, you know, t taking that obsession and, and, and turning it into, into you know, a better marketing for their customers. And there we go. And um, so, that, you know, that there's always a number of different ways you can cut these kind of things up. So apologies if anyone disagrees. Um, but for me, it falls into these um, three broad challenges. So they've, they've all existed before and um, I'm you know, sure um, that they'll, they'll continue to exist for some time yet. Um, but I think these in particular, uh, over the last year, they've, they've really had the, you know, the COVID floodlights shone on them. So they, they, they've really been um, kind of significant to clients. So um, I'm going to do this, I've realized I've got this in the wrong order, so I'm going to do it in reverse order or um, different order. Um, so resource, there's uh, there's never enough of it. That's, that's always been the case. Um, you know, we, we do uh, make do with what we can. But I think particularly over the last year, we've had um, e either some or all of teams furloughed. Um, we've had people you know, man managing childcare responsibilities, um, uh, budget cuts. So if the, the resource is under pressure, then you really have to use it efficiently. And then... Um, I see, you know, despite some of the positive trends around CDP and automation adoption, they, they do mask to some degree that many businesses are still having to manually manipulate and move, move data around in order to, to make everything work. So not only is that mind-numbingly boring for the poor soul that has to do that every day, it, it just burns time that you could be spending on improving your marketing. So it's, um, you know, and also it generally involves significant compromise. It's not like you're, you're hand cranking something that produces the same um, quality of output as the thing if you'd, you know, carefully machined it and it was automated. You've, you've accepted compromise in, in that output, in, in the capability that you can provide. They also, um, what, we're, what we've seen as a general trend the, um, within resource, the skill requirements of the marketing role just continues to broaden. You know, we, we expect to a lot in terms of the, the, the number of the things that a, a marketer has to be able to operate nowadays. And I think that does generally kind of decrease depth of, of knowledge sometimes. So I think it can be a challenge, particularly for smaller organizations to get that depth of experience in, their, um, in, in the people that work for them for, for implementing change in specific areas. Um, and we, we obviously see that in um, choice of, of technology where there can be, you know, let, frankly, many confusingly similar options and um, confusingly similar um, approaches that can be taken, but often with quite different outputs. So I think organizations are really gonna have to think about um, where that expertise is going to come from for them to, you know, to move forward. Back to the left, agility. Um, so we've got some great examples of clients that have, you know, amazingly kept their head above water despite the, the the wave of changes that they've seen to um to restrictions over the over the last year and they've really needed to quickly adapt their marketing strategy you know for some of them it's you know announcements made and they're having to do something in the you know uh, the next morning or in the afternoon in order to work around that and they're um you know so they're adopting their strategy they're they're using the operational data to send uh, service updates make a quick assessments of financial decisions you know if I, if I do this what's the what's the consequence for me and um and they're also um you know in, implementing new business plans and they they really need you know new types of information to be to be integrated in order to be able to make those reliable decisions so if you if your marketing stack doesn't doesn't have that uh, agility built into it um, then we're, we're back to the resources issue. So in order to answer those questions, someone's got to get the hand crank out again, um, uh, the, the, the data sausage factory, and um, push it through. And uh, you know, you're, you're making significant financial decisions on what could be limited or, or untested data. It could be the first time that you've put that together. So I think while we, you know, we desperately hope that we're, we're sort of on, on the way to being um, behind, um, sorry, in front of the, the, the issues from last year, um, and the, the implications have been, um, you know, far more extreme than you would otherwise expect. I think some of those those questions are around, you know, what what do our customers, um, you know, why do our customers do something? What might happen if we um, if we took a, a different route? Can we can we test this this particular um, scenario? If your if your data's um, you know, back to the untangling thing, if your if your data's in a mess, if it's not organised and uh, available in a way that lets you explore those questions. Then you, you you can't let that obsession loose. There's there's no way for you to to explore that reliably. So then on, on retention, there's um, there's a lot of interest in subscriptions, and I know we'll, uh, Julie will be talking a little bit about that. 
And um, that can be a really effective way to, to push up lifetime value, which is obviously the, the ultimate aim of retention. And it can also work for, um, for all sizes of business. As a, um, a, a slight um, kind of side anecdote, I've got a friend who started a, a coffee roasting business and she, um, she lives in the, the middle of nowhere in, um, on the west coast of Scotland. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and like um, kind of many other kind of similar businesses like that, she's, she's expanded outside of the geography and, and solved some of her problems by applying that um, subscription model and set, sending out the, the beans in the post every month. Um, so it's working really well for her. And it kind of means every, every morning when I'm having my cup of coffee, I get to think about subscriptions as well. So it's another, another prompt for me. But as, as companies scale up that um, the investment in that subscription model it that there's no built-in um, kind of magic retention wand that um, that solves all the problems for them and in many ways it, it magnifies the importance of retention so your um, you know your your acquisition costs and your profitability are normally based on the the expectation of a higher lifetime value so you might be um, paying more to acquire you might be accepting lower profit margin whatever it is that you've, you've done to um, you know to, to make that model work for you but if the customers are leaving after one or two months, then you, you don't have a subscription business. It's, it's not working for you. And you, you really need to obsess over those, those metrics of people moving through the, um, the, the, the cycle of the, uh, the subscription, the, um, the different customer cohorts where you're taking different approaches to recruiting people, um, the different communication cycles, the, you know, the welcoming, the, um, the, the nurturing, and also capturing people that do fall out the other end, bringing them back in again. So you, you need to really make that work. There's no, there's no free lunch in there. And subscription aside, competition for, um, I hate the term, but digital eyeballs, um, it, it just continues to increase, um, and, you know, particularly at the moment, every, every, everything's online. And um, companies just need to do uh, to spend more time to better understand the, the value of their existing customers and, and how they can invest in them to, to retain them. Um, so sorry, some t tough challenges there, but back to you, Ed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is tough challenges, and we're about to see how Julia's um, had tackled all of these, um, uh, not least the obsession uh, that comes with being a pet owner, I would have thought. Now, that, that's the subject of our first poll, um, which uh, uh, I think should be on the screen now, and it's quite a straightforward one, but we want to know about you and your pets. Are you a cat or a dog person? You've got four options. Yes, I love cats. Yes, I love dogs. I love both cats and dogs neither cats or dogs. We'll give you 90 seconds or so to, uh, to answer that. But Julia, are you a cat or a dog person? Well, I like both, Ed, although I prefer dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a very much dog person, always have been, but it doesn't mean I don't like cats. Cats and dogs don't often mix that well in the same household, so you, you tend to have to go one way or the other. One way or the other, yes, it's sort of polarizing like politics. Rob, cat or dog for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't dislike cats, but I'm I'm definitely <laughs> firmly in the dog category. Sorry, cats. Oh, I, I think I, I got burnt by growing up, um, growing up with dogs, and uh, and they were too much like hard work. So I've neither. That's the category. <laughs> <laughs> Although clearly everybody loves both. Now, um, have we? Are we get approaching a poll result yet? I wonder if we if we if we're getting there soon if that poll result can be pushed forward. I'm not sure if it's available yet. Um, but um, Julia, just while, we're, um, just while we're waiting, do you want to, uh, do you want to get started with your um, presentation and we can uh, maybe come back to that at, at, a, at a later second? Yep, sure. Hi, good morning all. Welcome. So hopefully today you'll enjoy learning a little about Nature's Menu and the journey that we've been on. So I've worked for Nature's Menu for two years now, and I'm responsible for driving profitable growth within our digital channels. So that's both business to business and direct to consumer. So today, uh, for those less familiar with the pet food industry, I'm just going to give you one simple page just to frame where Nature's Menu sit in pet food. Then I'll talk a little bit about Nature's Menu, who we are, what we do, and then I will share with you our direct-to-consumer journey. So the UK dog food, sorry, pet food market, doing it again as my um, <laughs> swing to dogs, is huge. So it's £3.2 billion UK pet food market. Just over half of it is dog. Um, within dog, 
the it's premiumization that's growing, not volume. There is a decline in the number of dogs and a move towards smaller dogs. So people are finding smaller dogs fit better into their way of life than larger dogs. A, a big trend in pet food is humanization. People uh, consider their pets to be members of the family and they want to feed them food that imitates human tastes and nutritional needs. And quite often where human diets go, pet diets go too. A growing number of pet owners are therefore starting to be more discerning and they're scrutinizing the products that they feed their pets. They're looking for premium, fresh, natural, healthy ingredients. And they're rejecting products that have unnecessary um, ingredients and elements to them. There's very much a strong bond between humans and pets, and we all want to do what's best for them. Cat food market is declining, um, and Nature's Menu operates in a very small part of this giant pet food world. So 3.2 billion is the total. We, our heartland, most of our business is in this small piece at the bottom, the 140 million raw frozen, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a moment. So who are Nature's Menu? We are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, and we are nestled in the wonderful countryside of East Anglia, picture top right. And we're all about premium natural pet food. So we're not mass market pet food. And we are pioneers of raw feeding. And last year in 2020, we were very, very excited to pass the 50 million pound turnover mark for the first time. So now I'm just going to play you a little short film just to um, give you a more of an insight into what we stand for as a brand. Nearly played again. So hopefully you enjoyed that. So we are primarily a UK market. We do have an export business, but 90% of what we sell is for the UK market. And we're mostly dog food. And that's mainly because we're mostly about frozen, raw feeding. Cats are less keen on this concept. It's important to note that the majority of pet food sold in this country is through the traditional traditional grocery channels such as Tesco, Asda, Sainsbury, etc. Nature's Menu's focus, however, is on retailing through the pet specialist channel. So for bricks and mortar, that would include uh, Pets at Home, Jolly's, Pets Corner, and two and a half, three thousand independent pet shops out there. For online, that's selling to pet specialists such as Fetch, Monster, Via Vet, Vet UK, etc. But we also have our own direct to consumer channel delivering direct to your households for your pets. And that's a, a, a focus of the second part of uh, what I'm talking to you about today. So who's this at the bottom? This uh, lady with a dog here, that's Jo, and she's our typical consumer. So it just gives you an insight into who we're marketing to. Our products, this is what they look like on the shelves. So most of those are uh, frozen products, apart from the cans and pouches at the bottom there, just to give you an idea what they look like. 
our business strategy. So I mentioned that we're a premium natural brand and I mentioned the trend towards humanization. Well, our mission is very much to get people the que to question the ingredients that go into their pet food and settle for nothing less than real. Real in every way is our mantra. We, in order to do this, we have to shout about raw and we have to shout about the fact that we very much have the highest standards of ingredients, processes and, and quality. But our biggest challenge is that less than two thirds of dog owners are aware of raw food. Less than two thirds of dog owners are aware of raw food. And we only have a 15% pen penetration amongst dog owners. So the chart on the right here just shows our sales, our sales out by online and offline. And what I'm trying to show you here is the trend and what happened around COVID. So this is 2020. So you can see initially in March, both channels shot up. And I'm sure a lot of food businesses, uh, both human and pet, experienced a similar trend. In April, our online business remained high, but our offline business declined as people stayed away from bricks and mortar shops, social distancing, etc. This trend then continued into May, but then offline recovered over the summer. And I'm delighted now to say that both channels are in really great growth. So for Nature's Menu, COVID sales has um, not had a detrimental effect. Um, we were absolutely delighted at the way that our business managed to deal with the initial surge in demand. Our websites remained operational, we had no outages, and the nation's pets continued to be well fed. So I'm sure all businesses have been affected by COVID in some way. For Nature's Menu, um, it, we were impacted very much by the switch to buying online as social distancing became the norm and people were reluctant to go to the shops. Uh, and at this point, some loyal brand purchasers first discovered they could buy from us direct, probably after frantically Googling, um, oh my goodness, I need to have nature's menu, I can't feed my dog anything else. And quite a few people were very surprised to see that they could buy direct from us. But we also managed to attract a considerable number of other new shoppers from other brands, which was great. We were definitely impacted by the changing landscape of pet ownership, although the impact of that is yet to be truly defined because, you know, there's lots of reports about people taking on pets that perhaps hadn't thought about it before, but then there's also a lot of pets going up for adoption. So we'll have to wait, as will the rest of the pet industry, to understand the full impact of this shift. We've all been impacted by being at home with our pets and spending more time with our pets. And that unique bond between human and pet I mentioned has definitely been strengthened during this time. We've also at Nature's Menu been impacted in the supply chain as the workforce uh, has been threatened. You know, as COVID cases be, uh, continue to rise, then the impact on workforces around the country is starting to show. We have extremely strong COVID control place, um, processes in place. But our warehousing and logistics operation has recently been impacted by the need for self-isolation. This impacts delivery times, which impacts the customer experience and our direct to consumer business. As a nation, we will recover from this, but the switch from offline to online has been accelerated considerably. And this will mean that data will become key for businesses going forward. Ed, have we got the results of that poll yet? Yeah? We have. They've literally just landed this second. Perfect timing. Um, so we, have, we we seem to have um, we we have an audience who are dog lovers. Um, yes. We have 40, 43 percent. I love dogs. We've got forty two percent saying that they uh, love both cats and and dogs, um, and uh, the eight, only eight percent saying they love dogs, and a, 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 a lowly eight percent sort of miserably not liking any pets at all oh. Maybe they birds or something like that um, <laughs> would you say that's representative of your of your what you see in your business or, or is it an even split well for us 
as I say, we've we, we definitely have more doc, uh, dog lovers as customers, mainly because of our key focus on raw, which, as I say, isn't really for most cats. So our business is 90% dog, 10% cat. Right, I see. Okay, well, uh, so the, we have got our second poll, which hopefully we'll be able to get the results of. We we'll maybe have to wait again till the end end of your presentation. But the second poll, um, which is up on the screen, if you look below the video, the video slot, you can spot it. It's uh, since the start of the pandemic, have you switched to ordering um, yours or your pet food, your pet's food online? Um, so trying to establish um, about some of the the trends that we've seen through the pandemic and which ones are going to stick. Um, uh, in the meantime, while, while you answer that, I'll hand back over to Julia to continue with um, her insight. Hi, thanks, Ed. So, direct-to-consumer business, home delivery. So I'm responsible for a small but fast-growing area of the business direct to consumer it's been around since 2003 in the business but it's never been a major focus for growth and today we're taking about 750 orders a day mostly for frozen raw packages and last year we delivered to 45,000 different UK home addresses several times over so it's not 45,000 deliveries 45,000 unique customers We've got our own fleet and we also use DPD. So when I joined Nature's Menu two years ago, uh, my role was to grow the online business. And although the business could see the potential for direct to consumer, it was not championed in the business. So I set out to give it some focus, but not growth at all costs. You know, growth has to be steady. We have to be able to deliver the products and remain profitable. So we wanted to grow in a controlled way and not be too disruptive of our heartland, the bricks and mortar business, you know, pet specialists. First, we needed to upgrade our e-commerce platform. We had one tired, slow portal trying to talk to both trade and consumers at the same time with the same voice that was never going to work our new platform had to give us additional functionality because this is how we were going to set ourselves apart from the competition and we had to upgrade the skills within the team we're a very small team so we need to be perfectly formed next on the agenda was data and insights we had lots of customers but knew absolutely nothing about them and were pretty much treating them all the same so investing in infrastructure and advertising is futile if our e-commerce platform is not optimised for conversion, which ours is not, still not quite yet anyway. More on that later. And we're doing all of this in order to earn our customers' lifetime loyalty, and particularly with something like raw dog food, which takes quite a while to discover and, and get into, and then you want to keep them. You know, when people find a food that their cat or dog loves and they can see a noticeable improvement in their health or their appearance or their well-being, they're less likely to switch brands. So if our customer service is impeccable, they'll stay with us. Our websites. So we had, I said, one website that spoke to trade and consumer. We now have three websites. Two of those are on the left-hand side, they're talking to uh, direct to consumers. So we have naturesmenu.co.uk and we have trueinstinct.co.uk. Uh, both uh, direct to consumer, two different brand propositions. So naturesmenu.co.uk is all about raw is best. True Instinct is about the best dry dog food. Most dog food sold in the UK is, is dry food. So this is the best dry food you can buy. And then a separate trade platform. So we've been quite busy. We launched um, three websites in the last 18 months. True Instinct is also in the process of rebranding to Nature's Variety, which is keeping us all incredibly busy. Uh, you know, we thought launching three websites in 18 months was stressful enough. But in mid-February this year, we're about to launch another 
Our custom built websites integrate directly with our ERP system. So we use Microsoft Dynamics and Vision. So all information pertaining to customers, products, and pricing is presented to the website direct from the vision. This has been a massive step change for us and makes everything far more efficient. And when an order is taken on our e-commerce platforms, it gets written direct to the vision. So there's no looking at orders in the CMS. It's all directly there for everyone to see in the ERP. A custom built website is not cheap, but the ability to add and enhance functionality gives us agility in our business. So along with data, functionality is key. Not just front-end functionality, but back-end too. And that's been particularly evident during COVID. Some of the back-end uh, systems that we've been able to implement to make sure we don't take more orders than we can process, to make sure we don't take orders for products that we've gone out of stock on for example. Our direct-to-consumer business model. So most e-commerce platforms have a, a one-time order process system. So you go in, place a, an order. Some offer a subscription-only service, such as HelloFresh or Tails.com, Bella and Duke. We offer both. So when we built our new websites, the idea was to offer both. You know, we we want people to be able to have a, a one-off order and also take out a subscription. So subscription means you have repeat orders regularly rock up. We don't persuade people to sign up for a subscription and then make it damn hard for them to get out of it either, like many I've personally experienced, such as my gin club. We make it as easy as possible for our customers to change the details, so where they want it delivered to, how they're going to pay for it, the products they want, the quantities they want, what day of week they want it, and how frequently they want it. Because of our agile custom-built platform, we can choose whether to also apply promotional activity to existing subscriptions. So when we run promotions, we can run a promotion that everyone benefits from, or we can run a promotion that doesn't get automatically applied to subscriptions. So we have a lot of, a lot of flexibility. So again, combine, combining our functionality with all the um, information we know about our customers, we can maximize the impact of what we do. A customer with a subscription has got less reason to visit our website, but we don't want them to miss out on deals and we, we don't want them to hear about a deal and be upset that they didn't benefit from it and go and cancel their subscription. So communication to our subscription customers needs to be very different to non-subscription customers. And sometimes, you know, we'll run a, an activity that's only for subscription customers and we make sure they realise that and we make sure they realise that they are not missing out. So our data informs us who those people are and what they buy and what pets they have. And this then allows us to nurture that relationship with the ultimate goal of um, their lifetime loyalty. We also offer a choice of delivery days. Again, not common in FMCG direct to consumer sites. Let the shopper decide. At the heart of our business is our customer journey. So last year we commissioned some work with a leading agency to understand our customer journey. Uh, this is a very, very simple summary of it. So on the right hand side, we've got the model. So it starts at the discover um, stage and that's the trigger for research. So remembering that raw dog food is most of our business, no one suddenly decides to switch to raw. They you know, there's a trigger to investigate it, spoke to someone down the park, uh, found out the reason their dog looks so great and got such a shiny coat is because they um, feed, they're fed raw. So you then go home and start doing your own research. So this is the, the trigger for the research. The exploration involves education, and this is where we have to demonstrate the benefits of raw. And it's, it's absolutely crucial here to be present at the right moment with the right information. And then fulfill is all about the moment of purchase. So at this point, we've got to alleviate all friction and ensure our products are front of mind. And then the switch. So the first seven days after purchase, this is where we have to support that transition. So endorsement then is where uh, they're hooked. They love it. It's great. And then we take their advocacy of raw 
to help fuel others to become the next trigger for the next discovery journey. This is just an example of how we get a trial in RAW. So the poo bag challenge, everyone at Nature's Menu talks poo, poo talk all day long. Poo is owned by Nature's Menu. One of the most obvious benefits of switching your dog to a raw diet is the changes in your dog's poo. Um, apologies to the, the cat people and the no pet people from the pole, but it's smaller, it's firmer, it's less smelly and it's easier to pick up. And uh, So we need to shout about this and we do shout about it a lot. And we have a poo bag challenge running offline and online. So we've talked a lot about our direct to consumer business model and our customer journey and poo. And let's look at our data now. So data for me uh, was the light bulb moment of the whole journey, which is why I've chosen this light bulb image, because that is when we truly knew who our customers were, how they behaved and what they wanted. And in May, June this year, uh, last year, we're already in 21, I apologise. So May, June 2020, we implemented our customer data platform. We chose Hive Marketing Cloud, Rob and the team. We spent several weeks designing our database and being trained. And then at Go Live, Go Live in mid-June, we were rewarded with the light bulb when we were fully trained and united with our data. Throughout the training, we weren't allowed anywhere near our own data, just dummy data, which was irritating at the time, but I know afterwards why it happened that way. So then when you're fully trained and you're given your data, this light bulb goes off and everything changes. So we now have privileged insights into our customers' behavior and can create audiences that are grouped by such behavior. So we can create audiences <laughs> Ah, dog barking. Sorry about that. I've got four dogs, two are on one side of the door and two on the other side. And someone's just rocked up with a delivery. This doesn't happen if you're on the podium and it's in a nice hotel somewhere, does it? Yeah, so for example, um, we can look, we can identify all of our customers who have a four week repeating subscription for raw dog food that also buy treats on an ad hoc basis. So there we go. We can try and get them to add treats to their subscription and buy them more often. Or we can um, look at people that buy dog food, but we know they've also got a cat. So say that um, our data tells us they've got dog and cats in the house, but they're only buying dog food from us. So segmenting our audience in this way allows us to be very targeted with our activities, but also personalization. What data do we have? So this is just some of the data we have. So we know whether our uh, customers have um, a dog or a cat or both, where they live, where we got them from, et cetera, et cetera. So There's just a list of some of the data that we now have that we can use to create dynamic audiences to feed our ECRM remarketing program. And it's very easy for us to see the overlaps between our audience segmentations too. So we don't send out duplicate or conflicting messages. So all of our audience can just be, audiences can uh, just appear in a simple Venn diagram. So we, we don't send two similar messages to the same person. So we know lots about uh, your pets. We know what breed they are and when their birthday is and what they prefer to eat, et cetera, et cetera. And then we combine all of that with actual customer purchasing behavior, what people are actually buying from us, what's in their baskets, how they respond to our marketing activities and their subscription behavior. Just because someone hasn't got a subscription today, it doesn't mean they've never had one, they may have canceled it. So untangling the data. So back in June, we had a good old play around and with lots of data, it's very easy to get lost and you do not need to understand it all on day one. We probably thought we would understand it all on day one, but we didn't. So I would suggest don't expect to. We made some small but completely revolutionary changes to our ECRM program straight away. And since then, we continue to test and learn every single day. 
for us, the focus is very much on the customer journey and how we get all that important lifetime loyalty. New customer acquisition is important too, of course it is, but it's important to also look after those you have, particularly if you want them to talk poo on social media. So it isn't just about getting new people in. So it was really important for me and the team to always see our comms from our customer's perspective. Are we engaging in an appropriate way? If they're a cat person, they don't want dog content and vice versa vice versa. So you in the minority out there that you're cat people, you'd be pretty upset if you bought your cat food from Nature's Menu and every email you got from us featured dogs. If you've just taken out a subscription with us, you don't want to get an email from us offering us offering you a special deal if you take out a subscription. But I, I would say, uh, warning, it is untangling data is pretty resource hungry. Okay, it is uh, there's just so much to go at that you just need to do it in a structured way. Taking lots of data and making sense of it is very difficult and be prepared to put in the hours, unless you're part of a large corporate that have got mega teams doing this sort of stuff for you, which we don't have at Nature's Menu, then be prepared to invest some time. Simplification of the data is, is a complex process, but get it right and you reap rewards. So how do we use the data? So we, we're very cat and dog specific in the content in our ECRM program, and also more recently, small, medium, large. So we talked about the difference between cat and dog people, but within the dog community, you have uh, small, medium, large dogs. And there's the same polarization amongst small dogs, large dog people as there are amongst cat and dogs, depending on the size of your dog. So with Dachshunds, Pugs and French Bulldogs at one end of the scale and German Shepherds, Vizslas and Labradors at the other. And then we've got all the medium sized dogs in the middle, the ever popular Cockapoo, Cavapoo, Spaniels, etc. So we're now able to ensure that anyone with a small dog, say you've got a little Dachshund, does not receive email content that shows pictures of golden retrievers, Malamutes, Newfoundlands, etc. You want something that is talking to you. We can and do offer promotions to specific groups. So these are only marketed direct to those um, audiences and those promotions aren't visible on our website. A big focus for us at the moment is puppies, supporting them from puppyhood to adulthood and ensuring they stay with us. Raw feeding has got many levels. So Nature's Menu, we offer complete and balanced nuggets. So complete and balanced means you don't need to feed anything else. And they are individually frozen nuggets. You just count them out, thaw them, serve them. A simple way to feed raw. But then there's hardcore raw feeders out there who like to do it themselves and prepare everything at home from scratch. So we also um, supply the ingredients to support a home prepared raw diet. Some customers may not be aware of that. And as they grow in confidence and want to prepare it at home themselves, we need to make sure we support them through that transition. So again, by taking all of this data together and understanding where they are in that journey, we can anticipate it. And of course, uh, we take every opportunity to present our subscription service to non-subscribers by repeating the benefits and highlighting the flexibility. And we'll always ensure that our most loyal customers are looked after and regularly reward them. So at the bottom there, you'll see in green, this data allows Nature's Menu to easily identify behavioral propensity, target key audiences, and also connect emotionally with our customers. So what's next for us and for, the, for our data? We've still got lots of gaps to fill. We don't know everything about our customer. And we have several projects underway to fill that those gaps. And there's many opportunities to be more focused with our content. So, you know, rather than just small, medium, large dogs, let's be breed specific. Let's have every bit of correspondence you receive from me has a French bulldog involved if you're into French bulldogs. I'm also keen to capture emotional feedback. So, you know, our database tells us how people are behave, you know, who they are, what animals they've got and what they're purchasing from us, their shopping behavior. But I want emotional connection in there as well. So whether we do that through surveys or whether we have our 
uh, FIFO reviews, for example, fed directly back into the database. There's more um, geographical options available to us now as well, and that's been particularly useful since COVID. So during the last few months, we've been easily able to respond to those moving through the various COVID tiers and reminding them that we're here for them. So when people are going into tier two, three, four, and it was happening by city and, and region, we could just um, target those people, remind them that they can buy from us. We're also exploring other geographical nuances as well that might benefit our comms, such as, you know, talking to people in a certain part of the country in a certain way and people in another part of the country in, a, in another way. Another vision of mine is to be able to calculate whether we are supplying 100% of that dog's diet. So we've got all the elements, it's just organising ourselves and, and, and making this happen. So for example, let's say we know that Freddie is a 15 kilo Cocker Spaniel, he's raw fed. We know he has moderate exercise, he's in good shape. So we know that Freddie should be eating around 700 grams of nature's menu raw nuggets a day. So if we compare what Freddie's owner is buying from us, and discover we're only supplying the equivalent of 350 grams a day. So Freddie must be eating something else as well. Perhaps he's having a different brand for his breakfast or dinner, or maybe he's having tinned or dry instead, but not from us. So Duke, on the other hand, is having about a kilo a day delivered to his owner. And according to our calcs, that's 100% of his requirements. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So guess where our marketing efforts will be focused? different messages that we're sending out. So if we know that the data tells us we're supplying all of Duke's food and only half of Freddy's, there's an awful lot to go at when you've got the data. It sometimes helps to start at the end point, such as this 100% of the dog's diet question and then work back from there. This is just a simple chart to show to show the progression from a contact to being a customer and then a loyal customer. So by gathering different data along the way, we can help to move someone along this path, get them to sign up so we can contact them, make that initial purchase, re repurchase, leave reviews, and then take out a subscription and then talk about poo on social media. So what's next for Nature's Menu direct to consumer? A rest would be good, but we're suckers for continuous improvement on Nature's Menu. So we've embarked on a 15 month project to further accelerate our digital acceleration, our direct to consumer acceleration. We hope to achieve another considerable step change by addressing our organic vis visibility of our websites, improving our UX, our on-site customer experience, ensuring we're mobile first, it's been a seismic shift to mobile ahead of desktop for e-com. We, we don't have a mobile first delivery at the moment, and we will do. And we have to make sure that our e-commerce platforms are optimized for conversion. So driving retention and loyalty through subscriptions is a key focus for future growth. And we're currently somewhere between quick wins and optimization at the moment. But we've also just kicked off a couple of the strategic projects as well. Last slide from me, just to wrap up the must haves, in my opinion, the web development uh, very much enabled everything that happened afterwards, but it, it's not just a one-off. If you're going to go down the route of um, improving your e-commerce platforms, it's not a one-off investment, it's continuous and it must stay continuous so you can stay ahead of the competition. You've got to have a solid business strategy. It's got to be centric to everything else that happens. You've got to know where you're going and have an outline of the steps to get there. Quantify your goals. You've got to know the end game. That's important. Otherwise, you'll never know whether you've got there. And determine what's important to you and measure it. Must have a set of KPIs. And you, you can't do everything when it comes to the data, which we thought back in June we could do everything on day one and you can't. So work out what matters the most to you. Try to fit it in with your own customer journey and don't try to make sense of it all on day one. 
subject matter experts. So data is complex and it's resource hungry. You need to surround yourself with experts and always think customer first. Always understand things from your customer's perspective and imagine you're on the receiving end of everything that you send out and passion. You can't do it without passion. You have to have a big helping of passion. That's me finished. Thank you very much. Back to Ed. Thank you very much, Julia, for that fascinating, uh, fascinating insight involving many elements, not least poo, um, which seems to be cent central to nature's many, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, I don't quite have the poll results yet. So you've still got an opportunity to um, answer the poll, uh, which has been very simple. Yes, no, but is, uh, has been going on for through Ju Julia's presentation. Oh, no, they've just crept in. Here we go. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, have you switched to ordinary ordering your your or your pet foods online it's a 50 50 split um well 51 percent um are saying yes and 50 uh 49 percent are saying no um which i guess is still a seismic shift that's half half the population at least of of our viewers have switched which is pretty big isn't it judah mm, interesting yeah <laughs> okay so uh rob over to you to see uh if you can let us know how hive can help yeah great there we go so um this is just a a, a small collection uh, we've got a wonderfully diverse client base and uh, as julia said we're proud to include nature's menu in that list and um, it's been uh, great being part of their story and um, so the platform really adapts around the, the requirements of each client. So um, an, an automotive client might um, might have vehicles and insurance policies in there. Uh, a travel client might have concept of inquiries and bookings. And uh, a, you know, a, a, a pet related client might have um, some concept of, of animals. And um, I'm, I'm glad Ju Julia referenced in um, one of her previous slides the, some of the conversations we've had uh, um, often termed as a single pet view there's this view that the, the the pet kind of represents almost a you know the most significant emotional connection that there is to the to the customer so it shouldn't just be a a, a property of the customer you know customers have multiple pets e each one is really significant to them and so it's that kind of that kind of attention to detail and and, and care really in the um in in how we work with the clients that, that exposes those that kind of potential for doing more exciting things with the data um, so all the clients have the, the, the same um, features, but we're just configuring them differently around, around their needs. So it's a, a really broad technology that, um, that, that sits behind that, that the, the clients have access to. It's, um, it's a pretty, um, you know, it, it is very, very broad nowadays, the kind of things that we, we need in order to be able to service the, the, the needs of the modern marketer. Um, so really at the at the core of that is the um, what we we now call customer data platforms it's had you know kind of similar but uh, but different names over in the past um, and that's where we we take that information from the the online and the, the offline sources um, some of them real time some of them historic and we we blend that together to create that that unified profile of the of the customer but as we just said it's it's not just customer information so you know, customer information is really really important um, but that other related information about the customer is equally valuable when you're when you're trying to create those those customer segments when you're trying to understand the different behaviors of the customer spot those different opportunities and they all they all have to be represented in their own way it's like so you can't you can't flatten out the, the collection of pets that um, that a customer has down to a, a single flag or something you need to represent that um, that data in its entirety so we can um, communicate. And we use the, the term engagement, but that's that's both outbound and inbound. So we can um, so we can communicate um, messages to customers and kind of see details about their engagement with those across a, a, a number of channels, including email, print, web, um, search ads, um, and you can choose to combine um, those those channels together, or you can sequence them so you know, kind of move people through, or you can optimize those based on the the, the relevant cost to you of those different channels. 
Um, data intelligence, particularly when um, we're talking about those kind of more exploratory and, and agile um, questions, and Julie gave some, some great examples of those. Um, there's a lot of capability within there for visualizing the data. So looking at um, overlaps between different segments of customers, um, looking at um, the kind of purchasing behavior of them. So again, using that data that's in there, just different ways of being able to visualize it and create different, different audience segments. And the, which leads us on to um, audience management. So uh, clearly within marketing concept, you have to be able to define the, the groups of customers, however you get there. Um, so that, that can be through simple rule-based, it can be behavioral, um, it can be static or dynamic, um, but it, you know, it can reference that, that granular and rich store of data that you've got in there to be able to create those, those audiences that you're communicating with. And then the, sit, the, the bit that sits on the, the, the top of that that, um, that, that manages those we refer to as journeys, um, some people call workflows, but it's it's that ability to um, both have uh, triggered and batch-based communication cycles rather than just single point-in-time communication. So within a sequence of messages, you're, you you understand the, the, the path that you're taking someone on. You've got opportunities to respond to their interaction with you. And so a, a lot of great um, great technology that sits behind there. And I think really our, our point is that the, the capability of any technology, you know, as or, or, or anyone else's, is, is only as good as its deployment and that, um, uh, you know, that, that care and love that we apply to the, um, to the, to the process of deploying it. So our, our, our team, as we, we talked about some of the clients, they've implemented systems across a, a really wide range of sectors they've got, and they're really experienced in, in working across those sectors. And they, they're you know, really well placed to judge how best to transform and represent that data in the system. You, know, you, you, you never start one of these projects with everything in it and perfectly um, formed state and you just have to load it in and, and off you go. There's, there's a lot of attention that, um, that, that, that we apply to that to, to work out the best way of representing it. And then, uh, you know, possibly unusually for a technology company, um, not, not only are we applying that expertise, but we're actually owning that process for clients. So we're, you know, we're, we're taking responsibilities sometimes for liaising with, with third party suppliers directly as well. But, um, but we, we own that process of uh, adapting the, uh, around any constraints that people have in order to create that, that final view of the data. And then it doesn't stop there. So Julia mentioned the, the, the training on the onboarding and I absolutely agree, it can be frustrating not to be able to get your hands on your data straight away. Um, but we, we have a great team there. It's the, it's the same people that you move through um, implementation into, into support. Um, so we so we kind of conclude the onboarding phase with a, a mix of training and coaching. Uh, training is great, but you've generally forgotten half of what you've um, what you've looked at by the by the next day. So we also run a series of kind of coaching sessions where we work with clients on their on their real world problems and, and you know kind of nurture them through using the the platform to to solve that. Um, and then we have the advantage that because we've we've gone through that with you, the the team understands your data. So you've got someone that you can fall back onto to um, that you know that really understands the data in your system, not just the the, the technology. So we can we can help out at any point. Um, so I, I guess our, um, our call to action at, at the end. And um, sorry for the, for the plug. Um, so you know, if you um, if you're interested in talking to us, it might be just that you want to compare and contrast on technology and and you know, capability and costs. So we can we can do that as well. We can just jump jump straight into demos if required. But I think you know more the more likely um, journey for the the people um, on this call is that. They, they recognize the challenge and there's been some, some obstacle thrown up. There's some reason why they're, they're, they're not able to solve those, those problems for themselves. And I think, you know, those are the people that, you know, w w you know personally, we get the most out of, of talking to uh, and helping. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's those people that, um, that, that really need to put their hand up and just kind of, you know, talk to someone about, the, about those challenges. Um, it doesn't cost anything. We're always happy to give um, opinion and we, we, we have lots of opinion to give. Um, so yeah, to please get in touch, and we, we'd love to talk about what's um, you know what's happening in your business. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rob. Um, now we've got we got a little bit of time for a few questions, and there's been some coming in. Uh, unsurprisingly, people are fascinated in your business, Julia, um, and how you've managed to go through this transformation. Um, uh, Matt um, has asked Julia, interested to know how you convince your business to invest in better CR CRM and ecom systems. What sort of payback were you looking for? What do you reckon? Well, the decision to 
uh, relaunch our websites was made before I joined the business, as was the vision of offering a subscription service. Bringing me on board was really to provide the focus and the drive to deliver the projects. And the introduction of a customer data platform was the logical next step in the process to unlock the insights that we now rely on. So it was, it was pretty straightforward. It was an obvious thing to do. Were there, so the decision was made before you joined, but were, were there key sort of drivers that helped make that decision that you're aware of? What was the, the key metrics? For the um, for the data, yeah, just to um, improve engagement from our remarketing program and to um, you know just drive conversion, drive customer yep. acquisition and, and conversion. Cool. So, um, uh, Rob, as you you touched on one of your slides, you said that um, there's. Um, uh, you work with a range of sectors and now uh, we've seen the, the pet food sector in great detail here. Have there been other sectors that have impressed you, on, especially in these tricky times? Yeah, I mean, I guess everyone will be aware um, in travel, some of the the, the, the challenges that are there for um, those organisations and, you know, it's, it's been pretty tough. And, um, you know, I think we're almost a bit hardened to it now that but you know, if you kind of think back to that first lockdown moment, that was a real shock to a number of businesses. And um, in the in the travel sector, there's this massive sudden buyer uncertainty about um, booking new holidays. And if if that's not bad enough, you've then got people who've already booked holidays that are then potentially looking to get their money back. So some um, massive challenges. Um, so there, I mean, there was there, so there was a lot happening in that sector. There's, there's one client in in particular that was just really really quick to adapt. Um, getting out in, uh, sorry, I can't name who it is, but um, uh, getting out in front of that customer concern. And, and you know, so rather than waiting for them to be, the, the customer to be coming to them, they're, they're, they're presenting options to that customer. Um, so using the booking data in the platform to be able to run automated journeys, to um, encourage rebooking in the, in the future, um, as, as, you know, and, and sort of moving that cycle of journey um, along in time as, as we, as we approach the point where they, they might be um, uh, not able to travel. Um, so, yeah, so it was amazing that just the pace at which they will be able to get that up and running. I think some, some was a little bit easier, but not so much for those with overseas destinations. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, oh, it's open. Oh, no, it's not open. So, uh, again, a, a number of kind of quick fire communications out there that just, you know, re required a, a lot of agility. And then similar to um, what Julia was describing, actually, with the, um, the, the geographic based stuff. So we've got, we've got some capability to be able to look at you know, distances between um, people and, and locations, you know, where they where they live, being able to um, uh, kind of create audiences based on geography. Um, so there were a lot of um, regional variations on restrictions in the UK. And, the, and this client, again, was, was using that to be able to match up almost the, the places where people could go on holiday and the, the, the places where they, where they were. Um, and again, automating that process, adapting around the, the, the government advice. So I think, yeah, it just really, you know, they had to work really hard for it. There was, there was no, no, um, no, nothing easy within there for them, but it wouldn't have been possible for them to have, um, you know, kind of managed to tread water and keep things going in the same way as they did without, um, without having that adaptability in place. So it was just brilliant to be able to, to watch that in action. Yeah, I bet. Um, it's all down to, you know, understanding the data, which is another question for, for Julia. Um, can you talk a little bit, little bit about creating customer segments based on data? In your experience, do these appear naturally or are there any kind of rules about how to create them? That's a question that's come in. Some appear naturally, such as the dog, cat question, the, you know, frequency of purchase, whether they've got a subscription or not, whether they've ever had a subscription, whether they've cancelled one, when their first purchase was, where they came from, um, how much they're spending, how frequently they're purchasing, all those type, but they're, they're the kind of more obvious ones. And it's, it's more really the ones when you play with the data and you sort of create pivot table views and then you'll see um, a section of people that you think that's quite interesting and then we can just take that group of people and then look at them further and then it, you just drill down and down and down and 
until you get to um, something that's really insightful where you then decide you're going to isolate that um, audience segment either as a one-off or as a dynamic group so a lot of our audience segmentations are set up as dynamic groups so anyone new comes along who meets the criteria just automatically ends up in that group so we can then use that in our journeys automatically so lots of playing around really and spreadsheet wizardry it sounds like um has it has your uh, data this is another question has your data been generated organically through going customer base or or have you bought anything oh in? yes that... no we haven't we haven't bought anything at all generated organically all organic yeah it must be difficult to buy in on in your sector in particular i would have thought so i think we're over time um so thank you very much indeed um both speakers um julia and rob for your insights it's been a great discussion but i'm afraid that's all we've got time for i do hope you've enjoyed this webinar quick reminder that the session is available on demand 24 hours after the live session finishes i have to admit i'm a little disappointed we haven't had more interruptions from dogs from Julia. I shut been... the door. Well, somebody <laughs> else shut the door. They're far too well trained, clearly. Um, but thank you, Rob and Julia, for taking part and sharing your expertise. Thank you, thank you everybody, for taking part and for the Q&A and for listening. And do enjoy the rest of your day.